Hello, family and friends. I'm Kanoi. Welcome to day 31 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365 using a Bible reading plan as laid out by the Bible Recap. If you want to find me on Instagram, you can find me there at Kanoi Gibson or at Notes and Hughes, where I will be posting extra Bible study tips throughout the year. Also, make sure that you join our brand new Facebook group, Bible study with Kanoi. There we will be able to give our prayer requests, encouragement. We can ask questions, whatever it is that you all have, but it is a better way for us to connect together as a community. I have linked below in the description box our Facebook group, all of my Bible study supplies, my ESV journaling Bible that I use, my highlighters, my pens, the Bible reading plan, other Bible study tools that you can use to help make this journey successful. And I encourage you to do that. Do studying on your own because I am a student of the word and that means that we are learning together. I am just here to make you fall in love with the word of God and if I get things wrong time to time, my goal and my heart is truly just to make you want to be here, to give you a broad understanding of the word so that you can grow in your intimate relationship with Jesus. With that said, I am ready to get into the word today. There is a lot to learn just like there was yesterday. So much to unpack in the book of Exodus. Yesterday, we saw that God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And today he's going to give them signs to let them know that he is with them. But before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. You are good. You are our holy Abba Father, Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim. Thank you for being with us. Emmanuel, here with us. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, whatever it is that you have created for us when you formed us in our mother's womb, from the beginning to the end, you wrote our story out, Lord. Let your will be done in our lives. Lord, use me, God, as a vessel to bring people closer to you. Let it not be my words today, but yours, Holy Spirit. I pray that you will open our hearts to receive everything it is that you have to speak to each one of us individually. Give us this day our daily bread, whatever it is that you want to speak to us, Lord, as we open your word. I pray that you breathe upon it, bring fresh revelation, and let it be accuracy, Lord, that is spoken and that is received. And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, Lord God, those who have hurt us, those who have done things, who have said things, who have criticized, who have judged us, who have put us in a place to feel like we are less than. Lord, help us as we forgive them. Help us to have a heart that responds in love. Lead us not into temptation. Please deliver us from evil. Keep us from the evil ones. Surround us, Lord. Protect us from the enemy and everything that he has against us. The darts that he is firing, Lord. The attacks that he is trying to launch. Let no weapon that forms against us prosper. We know that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We know that you are for us. That even though our enemies surround us, Lord, you surround our enemies. They will not win. For yours, God, is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Exodus chapter four, and this is another day of sticky notes galore. So let's just start here in verse one. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. So what's happening is here, remember, God yesterday said, this is what I'm gonna tell you to do. This is what you need to say to your people. You are to bring your people up out of Egypt. And he basically renewed his promise to Moses once again. But now Moses is like, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. Because remember, he started off all confident, right? But now he's acting in doubt and thinking they are not going to listen to me. So then the Lord said to him, verse two, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And I already have to make a stop right here on verse two, because God gives us something in our hand. He asks us, what is that in your hand? So Moses is holding a staff. If you look at a picture like Mary had a little lamb and you see her carrying a staff or a shepherd carrying a staff, it looks like a cane with that little arch at the top. So he's carrying the staff and he's like, I got a staff. Well, what is in your hand? 
What is the ability, the gift? What is the thing that you're holding on to that God wants to use? Do you even know what that is? Have you identified what gifts God has given to you to use for his glory? Are you a stay-at-home mom carrying a baby? That's your ministry. Minister to your children. Are you an accountant on a computer all day? Are you a basketball player fellowshipping with other friends? I don't know what it is that you are holding on to. Now, one thing we have to be careful of is that it doesn't become all about the gift because then what could easily happen is that we end up squandering the gift that God has given to us. For example, I've been a singer my whole life. I've also been a worship leader my whole life, but there have been many a times where I have confused the gift and confused the passion with performance. I squandered the gift. Sometimes that gift has to get pride out of our hand in order to make us realize that it isn't about that in the first place. It's about Jesus, but we use the gifts and abilities for his glory and for his purposes. Verse three, and he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent or a snake and Moses ran from it. So now God is saying, you see that gift I gave to you? Throw it down, let it go. Because sometimes we have to throw down the gift that maybe perhaps we squandered or maybe we're holding too tightly to before we can pick it up again. So he's saying, throw it down. It turns into a snake. Moses freaks out. He runs away. Verse four, but the Lord said to Moses, now put out your hand and catch it by the tail. Now, anybody who has ever seen a snake, dealt with a snake, knows that you do not catch a snake by its tail. If you catch it by its tail, it is just going to do this and that, and it's going to turn around and it's going to bite you. So in that sense, perhaps he is saying, stop trying to control things, Moses. Stop letting, stop letting this snake drive you. So he's saying, catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand, he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand again. So in that instance, Moses would have had to completely trust God, knowing that if he caught it by the tail, this snake would turn around and bite him. So he tells him to do this, verse five, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, is his hand was leprous like snow. And then God said, now put your hand back inside your cloak. So he did. He put his hand back inside the cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And he said, if they will not believe you, listen to the first sign that they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice. You shall take some water from the Nile and pour it onto the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So we see that God has given us gifts. Now he has given us a testimony. He is saying, watch what I do for you, Moses. You take out your hand. It looks like leprosy and leprosy typically in the Bible is speaking of sin. Now, this is also going to show that when his hand is restored, that is equal to salvation. God is here to redeem us. He is here to restore us. He is here to save us. He is here to heal us. He is here ultimately for salvation, right? Then when he came to save us, we now have a testimony about how he restored us, about how he redeemed our situation or our story. He wants us to do the same. He wants us to share our testimony, how he has restored, how he has saved us, how he has healed us, whatever it is that he has done for you. Are you sharing that with other people? And then when he speaks of the third thing, the third sign, taking water from the Nile and pouring it out on the dry ground, and then it'll become blood. Well, remember the Nile is the life source for Egypt. So when you take the water, the life source, and you throw it onto the ground and it becomes blood, well, the blood would symbolize that what they are drinking is actually death. So ultimately, we need to be born again. We need a savior. Abilities and gifts, we've got a testimony, and now we've been given authority to share this testimony with others, to share the true gospel, that we are all sinners, that we are all saved by grace, that we ultimately need to receive Jesus as our Lord and savior in order to have life.
But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. So he's basically saying here, listen, I've got a speech impediment. How are you expecting me to talk to these people? Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? So he's like, listen, I made you that way. Who are you to question the way that I made your mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So we may not be perfect and we are not perfect. We all know that. But God wants to use us anyway. And in fact, I said yesterday, those are the very people he wants to use. The ones with weaknesses, the ones with speech impediments, the ones who have messed up. Hello, that's me. And he's still using me. Verse 13, but he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then God gets angry. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. One of the few times that God actually gets angry and it is spoken of. The anger of the Lord was kindled against him and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? So he's like, do you not realize that I already had a plan in place for this? Your brother, Aaron, I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart because Aaron can speak well. So God is going to use Aaron's gift here. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth. And with his mouth, I will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. So he's basically saying here, you're going to be a prophet speaking the things that I have to say to Aaron. Aaron is then going to be a prophet of the words that I speak through you. Verse 17, and take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Now, the most interesting thing here to me is that God doesn't get angry when Moses kills somebody. He gets angry when Moses doubts, when Moses doubts his own calling. But what is even more cool is that God doesn't give up on Moses. He never gives up on you as long as you are having a conversation with him, as long as you are open, as long as you have not completely turned your back against him, he will not give up on you. So don't doubt your calling. You might not feel qualified. You might feel weak in the area that he is calling you. You might feel like your gifts aren't good enough, but trust me, if he has spoken it, let it be done. Okay, verse 18, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they're still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Because remember, Pharaoh was going to kill Moses whenever he was trying to break up the fight between the Egyptian and the Hebrew. So he fled to Midian and he ends up marrying Zipporah, which is Jethro's daughter. So Jethro is his father-in-law. So this is showing how much humility Moses actually has to go back at 80 years old to his father-in-law to ask permission if he can go back to Egypt. This is very honorable of Moses to do this. And Jethro says, go ahead, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. So now one of the reasons why also he can go back to Egypt is because anytime Pharaoh dies, any pending charges against anybody usually gets pardoned. It gets wiped out. So Pharaoh, if we remember back in, was it chapter three? somewhere that we read that Pharaoh died. So that means that the charges against Moses are now wiped away. So that is one of the reasons why he's able to go back and any of the men who are seeking him are gone. So how can we outlive those who are against us? Well, maybe not by the years of our life can we outlive them, but we can outlive them spiritually by simply continuing to do the thing that God has called you to do. You will have people come against you. You will have those that are firing darts. You will have those who are criticizing, who are judging, who are going to continue to try to tear you down. But if you just keep walking, you just keep moving in humility, it doesn't mean that you don't allow yourself to be corrected, but you don't allow the fiery darts to hold you back and to hold you down because that is exactly what the enemy wants. 
And one of the ways that you can outlive them is to allow your fruit to be seen, allow your fruit to be shown because the Bible says that a tree is known by his fruit. So consider your source, consider the ones who are coming at you, consider their fruit, their spiritual fruit. Are they sharing things in love? That is where discernment comes into play. And that is one of the greatest ways that we can tell whether or not someone's heart is right when they're coming at you before you take their word as truth. And when you can get there, when you can do that, you will outlive the enemy. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. So the miracles being the staff in his hand thrown onto the ground and turned into a snake and then picked back up by its tail and turns back into a staff. Then putting your hand in your pocket, bringing it out, looks like leprosy, putting it back in, bringing it out, it's restored. And then taking water from the Nile, throwing it on the ground and it turns to blood. So those are the three things that he's given him so far. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. 23, and I say to you, so now this is God talking to Moses, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. I hope I'm reading this correctly, but I got a little bit confused here. I'm like, wait a minute, what? God is going to kill Moses's firstborn son? So let's read on. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. What? I'm like, is it because of circumcision? Like, we know that Zipporah is a Midianite. So I'm trying to figure this all out here. Perhaps you know, but this is my conclusion from what I read in the study. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet. So we see here that she freaks out a little bit and says, Okay, if God's going to kill my son, I will get him circumcised. Well, why didn't Moses circumcise Gershom? Was he too preoccupied? Was he too concerned about this whole situation he's got going on and what God is calling him to do? Because this happens to a lot of ministers, to a lot of people who get involved in ministry. We get so consumed with the ministry because we want to serve the Lord. We want to do well, but then we end up neglecting our own family. It happened to me. Was his occupation more important? Was he caught up in the ministry? Or is it just simply because Zipporah, his Midianite wife, just didn't approve? of circumcision. So regardless, Zipporah goes ahead and gets him circumcised, but she goes and touches Moses' feet and with it says, surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God. Once again, notice the wilderness comes before the mountain and he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. So Moses told Aaron, now Aaron is telling the people, and did the signs in the sight of the people. So they show him all the things that God said, show them. And the people believed. So they see the signs and they believe him. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. So this visitation by God is for deliverance. Sometimes we'll see in the Bible that when God visits the people, it's usually for, for wrath, but here it is for deliverance. And we too have been visited. The word became flesh. That's how we see Jesus come about in John chapter one, and he dwelt among us. So Jesus now is able to speak perfectly to us through his word. He is the word that became flesh and he speaks to us now through his word, but also with the Holy Spirit. Chapter five. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. So Moses just walks in really bold, really confident, speaks to this tyrant, Pharaoh, and like, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But we're going to see that they are now going to panic. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? Well, what's interesting is him saying, who is this Lord? These words are actually going to haunt him later. 
I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, why is it that Pharaoh doesn't know the Lord? Well, the thing is, is that revelation is directly correlated to obedience. Pharaoh doesn't know the Lord because he has no intention to know him. He never wanted to know him. So I want to ask you today, have you been obedient to what the Lord has said so far? We won't receive more revelation if we fail to obey the prior. So if we don't take the step that God has said to take, if we don't walk or take that first step, he's not going to show us our next step. He's not going to take us any further than we are willing to go. Well, if you're sitting here saying, but I don't know my calling. Well, have you been obedient in the first step? I believe that God is always knocking on our door. He is always nudging us. He's always telling us what we can work on, what we can fix, how we can be better, where to go, what to do. It ultimately is just taking that first step of faith. And then he will show you. It's just like this Bible study. I didn't know how to do it, where to do it, what I was going to do. But I took the first step and God continues to reveal himself. Now, this was what God said would happen. He said, Pharaoh is going to hard, or I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he is not going to let your people go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. So he's like, "Mm -mm, we are not going to allow you to go away for three days. So now the people are going to start panicking here a little bit. Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and the foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So normally when these people were making bricks, Egypt or Pharaoh provided the straw to hold the bricks together. But now he's saying now they're going to have to go gather the straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. So he's saying, keep the quota the same. You shall by no means reduce it for they are idle. So he's like, listen, if they've got all this time to go make sacrifices to their God, they want to take three days off. They're just being lazy. They've got way too much free time. Therefore, they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. So he says, let heavier work be laid on the men so that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So he is telling the foreman here, do not listen to their request to go and worship. We as Christians are like, how could he do that? But listen, society does that to us all the time. You're going to church again? You're doing ministry for what? People are asking me all the time, so this Bible study you're doing, this is your job now? It's not my job. I don't get paid to do this. I'm trusting that God will provide in this year some way, somehow. Yes, it takes up the same amount of time as a job, but it's not my job. So you will always have society questioning you when you are serving the Lord, when you want to worship, when you want to go to church, when you want to be walking in the purposes of God. So when that starts to happen, take heart. Remember this, that the enemy will do everything in his power to keep you from going on that three-day journey with God. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land to Egypt to gather stubble for the straw. The taskmasters were urgent saying, complete your work, your daily task each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? So historical records actually show that they made enough bricks to make a wall that was 10 feet high, five feet wide, and would extend all the way from New York to Seattle. So it would extend the entire United States of America. That is a lot of bricks. How in the world were they able to complete this task that seemed merely impossible? Well, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, My load is easy. My burden is light. God is not planning to overwork you. That is not what he desires. He desires to get you to trust him, 
to get you to expand your faith, to get you to expand your belief that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So when you feel like you might be getting overworked, you might be doing way too much, you might be way too busy to do this and that, that is not of God. God will give you one step and one task at a time. He is not going to pile on all of the burdens the way that the world does. He's not going to fill up your inbox and overwhelm you. His desire is to get you to the place that he has called you to, one foot in front of the other and not coming there raggedy and exhausted and tired like most of us are today. I was just telling my husband today as we had a breakfast date, I said, you know what is the coolest thing? This seems impossible to be able to do this Bible study every day. I feel like I should be exhausted already. I feel like I should be tired. But every day when I complete my video, I'm refreshed. I am filled again. I rejoice. I am full of joy. And that is just how God works. But the enemy is going to try to hold you back from doing the thing, he is going to make it look impossible. But what seems impossible to the world is possible with God. Verse 15, then the four men, so the four men, I didn't explain it earlier, but the four men were the Hebrew leaders. So these were with the people, with, the, with Israel, with the Jews. They were the Hebrew leaders of the workers, also seen as the officers, so different from the taskmasters. But the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants. Yet they say to us, make bricks and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is on in our own people. But he said, you're idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. So Pharaoh, once again, gives him the same old answer. This is why we can't go crying to mom, crying to dad, crying to sister, crying to coworkers. We need to cry out to God because, listen, the world is not going to give you the answer that you want. Or maybe they will, but it's not going to be the best answer. Our best answer is always going to come from the Lord. Verse 19, the foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of your bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So they are now turning their anger to Moses and Aaron. Then Moses turned to the Lord. So notice that he doesn't go to somebody else. He goes straight to the Lord. And he said, oh, Lord, and this meaning Yahweh, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. So Moses is turning to the Lord over and over when people come against him. He goes to the Lord. And this was something I so needed to hear today. That instead of freaking out when everybody comes against me, instead of turning to this person and saying, oh my gosh, look what they're saying or reposting a comment, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go straight to Jesus and trust that what he has to say about it, he will answer. And I've been seeing it. I mean, I a lot of the times I can remain silent and somebody else will say something. So I appreciate you guys who <laughs> come in and say stuff. But sometimes you just got to be quiet, you know? Moses is going to the Lord asking basically, why is this happening to me? But did he forget perhaps that God told him that this is exactly what would happen? Chapter six, but the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do. So this is showing that God actually hasn't done anything yet. Now he's about to do something. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh for with a strong hand, he will send them out. So this strong hand implying that it's not God's strong hand, but it's Pharaoh's strong hand who will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. But we will see throughout the Old Testament that the strong hand generally speaks of God. So yes, this will be Pharaoh's strong hand doing the actions, but ultimately God is the strong hand. And so even though it is Pharaoh's physical strong hand, it is God who's going to be working through his hand. 
So he is saying, listen, Moses, be encouraged. This is what I'm about to do. Verse two, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. And God Almighty, once again, being El Shaddai. But the but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So he's like, they knew who I was, but they didn't have an intimate relationship with me. I also established my covenant with them, this being the Abrahamic covenant, to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Sojourners, remember, being strangers. They're all strangers in Egypt. They're resident aliens. They don't have citizenship here. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, this does not mean that he forgot it. When God says that he has remembered, it means instead that he's ready to fulfill his obligation to the covenant that he has made. So therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. So notice all the I wills. I am. So he is reestablishing once again who he is and what he's about to do. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. I get it. I get it. When you are broken, when the enemy has come against you, I get why it is so hard to then hear the word of God, to read the word of God and to believe that God is for you. And God is saying, you know what? They don't believe me because they have not experienced the reality of the living God, but they will. And we'll see that happen in chapter 14. But this ultimately in these verses is God's plan, his floor plan for Israel. This is his purpose for Israel. So one, he wants to deliver them from Egypt. He wants to have them become his people or a fellowship of believers. He says he will be their God. He's going to have a personal relationship with them. And he says he will bring them to the promised land. Those are the four promises, the purposes that we are seeing for Israel. Now notice the comparison with God's plan for us. He too will deliver us from Egypt. Remember, Egypt is a symbol of the world or the world system. So through Jesus, we will receive salvation from the burden of sin. He, he liberates us. He redeems us because he says here that that's what he will do. He will set them free and he will redeem them. Number two, we also will have a personal relationship. We also get to become a fellowship of believers. We also become adopted into his family ultimately when we receive Jesus. Then number three, oh, this is where they talk about the personal relationship. We too will know him intimately and become his people, just like Israel are his people. And then number four, when it says he will bring them to the promised land, well, he too will give us direction as we are sojourners here on earth, and he will reveal to us or give us revelation as we are on our way home to our own promised land in heaven. So summing up once again, all of the I wills, all the things that God said, I will do. He says, I will save you. I will liberate you. I will redeem you. I will adopt you. I will reveal to you, give you revelation. I will give you direction. I will give you provision. These are the same things that he does with us. And he ultimately ends up renewing his commandment here in verse 10. So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt to let the people of Israel go out of his hand. It's like, or his land. It's like, how many times do I have to tell you this, Moses? <laughs> but Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. He's like, I cannot speak. How are they going to listen to me? Because already the people have proven that they won't. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So he simply repeats himself in response to Moses's doubts. And he is saying, Moses, Aaron, we are not negotiating this. Same command, same story, 
Second verse, same as the first. You still need to do the thing I told you to do. And then I am actually going to skip for a second chapter or verses 14 to 27 because this is almost like a little bit of a pause in the narrative. And we're going to go to verse 28. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So again, a repetition of what just happened over here. And this is the seventh time that Moses argues. But guess what? God still does not give up on him. So now that we go back to where the pause was in verse 14, we see inserted here, right in the middle of the narrative, the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. So these are the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben. Remember Reuben being the firstborn of Jacob or the firstborn of Israel here. Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul. The son of the Canaanite woman, these are the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Mirari, the years of the life of Levi being 137 years. Okay, so watch what happens here. From Levi comes Gershon. From Gershon, his sons are Libni, Shimei by their clans, the sons of Kohath, Amram, Amram being Moses' dad. So it goes Levi to Gershon to Amram, then to Moses. Um, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel, the years of life of Kohath being 133 years. The sons of Mirari, Mali, and Mushi. These are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. Amram took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. So remember yesterday was saying, we'll figure out how or when, but apparently Amram and Jochebed are the mom and dad of Moses. Well, here it is stated. The sons of Izhar, Korah, Nepeg, and Zikri. I don't know what I'm saying. The sons of Uziel, Mishael, El Zaphon, Sithri, Aaron took his wife, Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, and the sister of Nation. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Aser, Elkanah, and Biasaph, <laughs> these are the clans of the Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites by their clans. Look how obedient we are being in trying to pronounce these names. These are the Aaron, uh, Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. Why was this so important to talk about the genealogy? Ultimately, so we can know where Moses and Aaron came from because we are about to see their entire lives unfold in the next however many chapters of when they are trying to bring the people up out of Egypt. Are you still with me? I hope that you were able to take in all of the things that we were able to learn today and to hear something that God has spoken directly to your heart. Have you heard something? Let us know. Encourage us to know that God is speaking to his children. Now, if you're not a child of God, if you haven't accepted Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity. All it takes is a simple prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And all you have to do is be in agreement with me and everyone else as we say this simple prayer. Now, for the rest of you all, don't go anywhere because we are going to go over some of the study questions as posed by the Bible recap. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for loving me, for choosing me, for calling my name, for letting me be here today. You knew, Lord, that I needed to come here. It is not an accident, but by divine appointment that I'm here in this space this very day. So today I hear you call my name and I respond. 
I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, knowing that you came to the earth, believing that you rose again and died for me, that your blood would cover all of my sin, that you would wash me clean. I thank you, Lord, that you have saved me up out of Egypt, that you are going to redeem me, that you are delivering me, Lord, that you are clothing me with robes of righteousness, and that I will be able to walk with you from this day forward until I come home to the promised land. So as I sojourn here on earth, Lord, as I am a resident alien, Lord, in this world but not of it, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide me throughout the rest of my days. Help me to be a light of the world, Lord. Help me to shine Jesus to other people. Help me to link arms with all of my brothers and sisters here to be able to expand the kingdom throughout the world. I praise you and I honor you in this time and I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. For those of you who want to do a little bit of extra digging, extra studying, extra credit, whatever you want to call it, here are some of the questions that the Bible recap has laid out. Number one, how would you summarize each of Moses' excuses today when God appoints him? Number two, God promises opposition from Pharaoh, but says Moses will eventually succeed at rescuing the Israelites out of slavery. According to chapter three, verses 20 to 22, what will they take with them when they go? Number three, based on what relieves God's anger in chapter four, verses 25 to 26, why is God angry in chapter four, verse 24? Why was this so important? Use a study Bible or commentary for help if you need it. And I discussed this with you, but you can take it a little bit further if you would like. Look it up for yourself. Journal on it. Number four, when Moses and Aaron get to Egypt and obey God's commands, do things get better or do they get worse? Review chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, and list all the things God says he will do for the Israelites as a group. What does he ask of them in return? And number 6, according to chapter 6, verse 9, why don't the people have believed Moses when he tells them about God's promises? So those are some of the things that you can look at. We mostly discussed them. But like I said, you can put your own thoughts, journal about them. And I believe that whenever you choose to do that, when you choose to get closer to the Lord, to truly understand him and his word, he will begin to reveal things to you that he cannot do through anybody else. He wants you to have your ear turned towards him. So that is my prayer for you today. If you've got any prayer requests, please let us know, or you can ask them on our Facebook group or even put them right here in the comments. I'll see you tomorrow as we read Exodus chapters 7 through 9. Until then, I send you off with a big ahoy ho. God bless you guys and aloha.